Hello, everybody. My name is Steve Matthews, and I can be found on uh, YouTube under Teeth of the Lamb or on Facebook under Steve Matthews. Today we're going to talk uh, about field rotation and its errors, part two. Uh, try to do a little better job of explaining exactly what I'm talking about. I'd like to ask each of you to pay very close attention to these uh, meteors as they traverse from horizon to horizon in an absolutely straight line without any atmospheric distortion or atmospheric lensing, no refraction or bending of their trajectory at all. It's significant to point out that these meteors are said to be skipping along the outer uh, edges of the atmosphere and as they do they light up. So if we were ever to see a really good example of refraction or lensing or any of these distortions that are so talked about, we would expect to see them the most from these uh, meteors that are skipping along the outer edges above all of our atmosphere. Yet we see zero, nada, none. No distortion or bending of the light at all. According to the predominant way of thinking, we would expect to see the most uh, bending and distortion uh, at the horizon, yet again we still s we see none. I like to drive this point home because this uh, distortion is used for oh so many excuses and uh, one being the shuttle launches. I suppose all of you remember this, uh, an arch when they're trying to shoot straight up into space and would like to have you believe that it's an optical illusion when uh, it's nothing of the sort. If it were true we would see distortion in those meteors by all means being on the outer edges of the atmosphere. Let me be clear here that I'm not saying that atmospheric distortions don't exist. I'm saying that they don't exist to the degree and are not the excuse for a lot of the things that we see. Under the right conditions, yeah, you can have a uh, distortion. I'm a firm believer in what I see is real until I have a good reason to believe otherwise. The psychological warfare and the intellectual fraud portrayed by NASA when they tell you that they're going straight up into space and they show you pictures like this. Well, I'm calling BS on this right now especially when we can see meteors traversing the outer edges of the atmosphere from horizon to horizon and exhibiting no distortion whatsoever, as straight as an arrow, even down on the horizon. That's uh, a telltale sign that we're not being told the truth once again. The things we see are not illusions. And we've been way too gracious with those people that are trying to make us believe that they are. So I'm going to play one more minute of this uh, meteor showers and then I'm going to get on with the topic that I actually intended, uh, part two of the uh, field rotation and its errors. Yeah, these meteor showers were supposed to just be a side note. I wanted to get the word out there so people don't get ate alive and relinquish, relinquish the floor to the Globers every time. In just a moment, I'm going to play a short clip from Science Monkey, uh, the celestial sphere. And um, basically, all, all the uh, celestial sphere is, is the visible sky, which is uh, actually the celestial dome. And uh, they've added another side to it since the heliocentrics have taken over. It's all a geocentric uh, model which means that the Earth is not moving. All it means is just what we see in the arch of the sky from horizon to horizon. And today we're going to be talking about that. We're going to talk about what we should see if all of the sun, moon, and stars were as far, as away, far away as they say. One last point that I'd like to make here is about the distortion. 
is that when you look out on the horizon and see a super moon or a very large moon, you'll see the moon is increased in size, but the stars around it, they haven't changed. And I don't know what that means, but it's significant, I think. These pictures of the Milky Way galaxy are just absolutely stunning. And um, I'd like to play just a little bit of it here for you because they're just beautiful. <laughs> That's all I can say. And then we're going to talk about the arch of our visible sky and the path that the sun and the moon and the stars should follow. They shouldn't all follow in the same path. And uh, I might be corrected on that, but I'm going to explain that in detail here after Space Monkey gives a one minute presentation on our celestial sphere. Every time I start looking at a different topic that NASA or the schools are teaching, it, it crumbles under just very little observation and very little scrutiny. Uh, just a little thinking and it nothing works out. Numbers don't add up, uh, things don't make sense, and they keep telling you that you don't need to worry about distances. And uh, I think distances are quite important because we're talking about vast dis distances and that becomes very important. Okay, here we go. On with our topic, field rotation and its errors, part two, before I bore everybody. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back. I'm Mr. Stano, your Earth Science teacher, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the celestial sphere. The celestial sphere is the backdrop that everything appears in either the nighttime or the daytime sky. If you take a look, we have this little gentleman right here looking through a telescope, and all the stars appear to be on this right here, this dome that surrounds us. There's a couple of components. You can see that he stands in the middle. The observer always stands in the middle of their celestial sphere. And we have our directions down the bottom. We can see north, south, moving this way, east, and west right here. All the stars, everything up here, it appears two-dimensionally to be surrounding us. So when you look up in the sky, it doesn't matter if it's a plane, if it's stars, the sun, uh, anything, any other satellites that we may see, that's all appearing on the celestial sphere. So I've put together a little illustration uh, to help explain what I mean when I say that you'd have three different angles of arch traversing the sky. One by the moon, one by the sun, and another by the stars. Think of each of these as having their own personal orbit. And the moon would have one orbit, and the sun would have another, and the stars would have another yet. And each one of them vastly further away. And as you increase the size of the orbit, you increase the size of the circle, and or the arch. In our observable sky, all of the celestial bodies follow basically the same path. And what I'm saying is that's not possible if they're vastly different distances away. The astronomers and the scientists and the teachers will tell you that distance doesn't matter, that we can't tell how far away these items are. Well, I have it all on my chart right there above. Uh, how far away everything is, they tell us that. And my point is that they have to bring everything back to one level plane, because that's where it is. It's in our firmament over our heads. And I'm telling you also that you can indeed tell how far away these items are by the path they take across the sky. The ever-increasing distances would demand that the arch, the circumference, gets larger and your arch is going to be a lot smaller as you move further away. And we're not talking just a few miles, we're talking vast dif differences in, in distance. 
an example, I would suspect that most of you have played with a paint program or something on your computers. And you start, if you take a circle and you start enlarging it, uh, you start out with a small circle and pretty soon it's uh, reaching the edges of the page and you keep on going with it and pretty soon it's off the page and you've got a, an arch across your page and you keep increasing it and eventually all you've got is virtually a straight line across your page. And this is what I'm talking about. But that's a little circle. Now, when you start talking about increasing the circles by millions of miles, uh, it, it makes the arch flatter, always. So we have here on my illustration the bottom where the dome is, and that would be where everything is placed in one sphere over our heads. And in that diagram, everything at the same distance would give you one arch for everything. Now we move up to the moon. It's 239,000 miles away. And they say that you would have to take your size of your earth and multiply it by 30. And that would give you where the moon would be placed. That'd be a big circle. And it's not going to be much of an arch. And then we move up to the sun. It's 93 million miles away. It's 400 times the distance of the moon, so they say. That's going to make your arch much less uh, steep. And then you move out to the stars. The closest star, Alpha Centauri, is 4.3 light years away. And that's 186 miles per second at the speed of light for 4.3 years. And I'm saying, at that distance, you'd indeed have a straight line. It wouldn't have any, any rotational arch that you see like in the stars. No, they have to bring everything back to a single plane for this very reason. So today we've learned that meteors and their skipping across the outer atmosphere can give us a good indication that the atmospheric distortions that we see are not as severe as what we're led to believe. We've also talked about distances do matter, and we can tell how far away the sun, moon, and stars are, because they all follow the same path. They must all be on the same plane. And we've discussed how you can determine that. And on that note, I'm going to say, have a darn nice day. And if you like what you heard here today, subscribe and like. Thank you. That this uh, yellow sphere is actually on a rod. And if you rotate this, the path of this yellow sphere across the sky will represent the path of the sun. It turns out that it uh, can cross the celestial equator right here. It will rise up and get about this high on the celestial sphere. It will cross again back over there and then come back over here, go down to about this far on the celestial sphere and then back up here again. I talk about it in such great detail because that's key to the coordinate systems that we use on the celestial sphere. This path of the sun shown in red right here is key to our coordinate systems for stars couple of quick thoughts that I've been uh, thinking about lately. One, that the sun, the 23 and a half degree tilt that they gave to the earth, it may be related to the lack of any arch uh, in the heliocentric model. And another thought that I've had is in the rotation of the face of the moon throughout the day, that I believe what we're seeing is real on a flat earth and that that moon is not tidally locked to the earth but is magnetically locked to the sun and that causes real rotation.